Um, yeah, when I was coming to this meeting, or well, actually when I got invited to come to the meeting, I had no idea what disruptive conceptualisation was. I'm not entirely sure I still understand completely what it's about, but um, from what I've learned this morning, at least in the really exciting and interesting lectures that we've had, is that um, innovation can be very disruptive and, and actually when I started to think about it I realised that biological evolution is probably among the most disruptive of all types of innovation because ultimately it leads to adaptations that cause other members of the same species to become extinct, uh, more or less. So carrying a species onto a new level of, um, of development. So all competitors are basically outcompeted by the evolution of a sudden new character which suits the species better to the new challenge that has arisen during um, evolution. I'm going to be talking about one such extreme evolutionary outcome uh, today and how we've learned something from that that has allowed us to develop um, a technological, well, a, an algorithm actually that improves um, um, image quality and very dim light that uh, we've had a collaboration with Toyota um, to develop new camera systems based on this that is purely coming from Blue Sky's basic curiosity-driven research on the way animals solve very, very difficult problems, which is my interest to 99.99%, I have to um, confess. Um, so I work on nocturnal vision. I have my entire career. I'm very interested in how animals that live in, uh, in very dim conditions, actually at night and also in the deep sea, are able to see as well as they do. Because believe me, and I hope I convince you in my short presentation today, that nocturnal in animals, even very small ones like insects, are able to see extremely well, much, much better than we do in very dim light, despite having eyes and brains a tiny, tiny fraction the size of our own. Uh, but before I do, I thought it might be instructive just to, to tell you something that you probably don't necessarily realise, but maybe you do, that if you're standing out on the middle of a paddock in the outside of Copenhagen somewhere where it's quite dark, and you're there on a sunny day, um, then the light experience that you would, ex that you would experience from the middle of, of a sunlit day to the middle of a starlit night will be about 100 million times. Uh, that's a huge range of light levels, and no single light, uh, sorry, visual system has adapted to see well at all of those light intensities. We ourselves, as organisms, have evolved to see in the brighter end of that range, and we don't see very well in the dimmer end of the range at all. In fact, very poorly, actually. Uh, if you live in a rainforest with a very thick canopy, then light levels are 100 times dimmer again, just simply because of the light absorbent properties of the, of the canopy. Now, what is probably very common sense is that when it gets very dark, um, we have a problem, and that is that vision becomes unreliable in dim light. And the simple reason for this is the amount of light that reaches our photoreceptors, our light-sensitive cells in the retina, becomes a lot less, clearly. Uh, the other thing that happens is that the noisy signals uh, that are present in the photoreceptors, even in the absence of light, start to very seriously contaminate the little bit of signal that you have in dim light. Uh, it's the same kind of problem you'd have in an in a, in a in a in a electronic detector of light. The obvious way many animals that are active in dim light and see very well in dim light have overcome this problem is simply to get much larger eyes, which have very much larger pupils, which let in a lot more light to the, to the light-sensitive retina. And a classic example of such an animal is this creature, the tarsia of Spurkeur, a very small animal, only about this big. Um, it was, this animal was actually the inspiration for this very popular toy uh, that was out about 15 years ago called a Furby. Uh, you probably see the similarities actually. <laughs> um, but this, eye, this animal is, is, is renowned for having gigantic eyes as its cranium quite clearly shows. Uh, the skull of this animal is completely dominated by eyes and the chief reason it is, is in order that the eyes can also have a very large pupil. The bigger the eye, the larger the pupil you can have. Um, this eye, or well, these eyes are so large that um, you could actually pull out the brain of a tarsia and stick it inside one eye and still have a ton of space left over. Uh, the eyes are that large. In, despite having a body this size, the eyes of this animal have a pupil which is, about, uh, is over 20 millimetres across in the dark. Our pupil is at maximum about 8 millimetres across in the dark, so that's an enormous difference in light capturing ability. And not surprisingly, these animals see extraordinarily well in dim light. They're able to leap from tree to tree, completely visually, um, in a rainforest environment. 
um, something we couldn't possibly do uh, without getting a very bad headache. Um, they were also able to catch prey entirely visually, including flying insects, which they can pluck from the air, entirely using their eyesight. Now, that's fine if you have a big eye relative to body size like Atasia, but as soon as you start getting small, as many animals often are, then just by the mere fact that your body is small, your eyes also become small as a result, just by simple scaling rules. And a classic group of animals where this is a problem are the insects. And insects, as you probably know, have a type of eye that's very different to our own, and these are called compound eyes. And I'm going to just just digress a tiny bit to tell you what compound eyes are like and how they're built in order to explain um, a little more about um, uh, what I'm going to tell you next, more or less. When you've looked, if you ever look at a, an insect's compound eye, you'll see these little tiny hexagons on the external surface. You've probably all noticed them in pictures of insect heads. Um, those little tiny hexagons are actually minute lenses, just a few tens of micrometers across. Each one of them is actually... Is this a point of this thing? It is, isn't it? Yeah. Each one of these little hexagons is actually focusing light down. You can see a, there's a second lens underneath, actually. There's a rod-like bundle of photoreceptor cells directly below there, which is actually receiving light focused by that tiny little lens. And in an eye like a dragonfly, which you should see here, each one of these tube-like structures, which consists of these pair of lenses, and this rod-like bundle of light-sensitive photoreceptors directly below, this tube-like structure is known as an omatidium. And in this type of eye, which is called an apposition compound eye, and I'll just show you, just briefly, I'll go to the next slide and back again, this is what it would look like in cross-section. Here you see this rod-like bundle of photoreceptors, these lenses on the external surface of the eye, which are hexagonal. You see nine of these omatidia in cross-section, um, and each one of them is receiving light from a small region of space so that two omatidia receive light from two completely separate regions of space. Also, particularly in this particular type of compound eye, because there's, um, between these omatidia there's, a, a, there's actually a black screen of light-absorbing pigment that goes all around the outside of this omatidium, it turns out that each one of these omatidia is, is totally isolated from all of the others. So in other words, light that, reach, that, reaches the, um, that enters this lens only reaches the photoreceptors of that same omatidium and can't pass to a neighbour. So in other words, each one of these is optically isolated from each other, from all the others. Each one of these omatidia is actually coding light that's coming from a tiny region of space, a kind of a pixel, if you like, of visual space. It codes the average intensity, the average colour, and in many cases, even the average plane of linearly polarised light coming from that small pixel of space. This means that two neighbouring omatidia are actually coding light coming from two neighbouring pixels. And in the largest compound eyes, like those of dragonflies, which, where each of the two eyes has about 30,000 of these omatidia, that means that the two eyes together, which see the world almost in 360 degrees wraparound panorama, they actually um, sample the, um, the world with about 60,000 pixels in total. Now, it doesn't sound like an awful lot of pixels if you compare it to a modern digital camera, or even to our own eyes, for that matter. Um, but that doesn't in any way mean that these animals don't see very well. I mean, dragonflies can actually catch flies in mid-flight out of the air and eat them. Um, and if you try and catch a dragonfly with a net, you'll have a great deal of difficulty because they see extremely well. So sheer pixels isn't everything. But the the biggest problem with this type of compound eye is, especially for use in dim light, or particularly for use in dim light, is that these omatidia are each have these the photoreceptors in each omatidium are receiving light only through that tiny little lens. And as I said, that little lens is only a few tens of micrometers across. So it's a very, very tiny pupil, and not therefore very sensitive to light, and therefore not very useful in very dim light, one would think. And not surprisingly, most of the insects that possess this type of compound eye are referred to, um, or sorry, are day active um, insects like flies, uh, uh, grasshopper, is it the grasshopper? I can't quite see it, or praying mantis, I can't quite see from here. Bees, dragonflies, um, butterflies, they all have this type of compound eye because they're active during bright daylight. If you're truly a nocturnal insect and have evolved nocturnal behaviour a long, long time ago, you're more likely to have the second major type of compound eye design, which is this one, the superposition eye. In this design, it's still made up of omatidia, but the photoreceptors, which were touching the bottom of these lenses in the apposition design, have been pushed back to the back of the eye in the superposition um, design. And in addition, that black pigment that was separating the omatidia 
in, this, um, uh, in the apposition eye, in the dark at least, have been pushed back to the outer surface of the eye to lie between the lenses. This has left a big optically clear region in the middle of the eye known as the clear zone, and due to an amazing graded refractive index optical system in each of these lenses, which turns each one into a, a very tiny little Keplerian telescope, it's possible now for not a single lens, but for hundreds or even in some extreme cases, thousands of these lenses to focus light down onto single photoreceptors in the retina, which is a tremendous improvement in sensitivity to light. And not surprisingly, this type of compound eye is very, very common in nocturnal beetles. So if you see something bashing against your window at night, if at your summer house out in the country, a big beetle, they've got this type of eye. So too do nocturnal moths. Uh, universally, they've all got this eye for the same reason, that they're active in dim light. And we now know that these um, eyes give insects that possess them very, very um, good um, vision at night. In fact, this moth here, which is common in Denmark in summer, which you've probably never seen it, because it's busy hovering in front of flowers and sucking nectar on the wing like a hummingbird in the dead of night when you're fast asleep. Um, it, we discovered uh, a number of years ago, has true trichromatic colour vision. That is a colour vision system very similar to our own, um, but completely for use at night to search for flowers. And this was, in fact, the first animal known to be able to see colour at night. We can't ourselves see colour at night. We lose that ability in mid-dusk. And we've always believed quite arrogantly, as humans often are, that all other animals, therefore, must not be able to see colour either, because after all, aren't we the pinnacle of creation? It's unfortunately a great heap of bunk. Uh, there are now several animals we know, or many animals that we know now, that can see colour at night, um, uh, because they've got very, very sensitive visual systems like this moth. We also know that many species of, of beetles, particularly dung beetles, which I've spent a large number of years working on, um, the navigational and visual abilities of dung beetles, believe it or not, they navigate at night. I'm not going to go into the details now because, because I don't have time. But they use various cues in the environment to navigate. And we've um, shown a number of years ago that uh, dung beetles are able to use the constellations of stars to navigate in and keep straight line courses while they're rolling balls of dung in the South African veldts. Uh, so the Milky Way in particular is an extremely um, important cue for them for navigating at night. They're also able to use um, the very weak pattern of polarised light formed around the moon to do the same thing. But when the moon isn't present in the sky, which happens for roughly half of every month, um, they're able to fall back on the Milky Way as a navigational guide instead. And these are very, very dim cues and very difficult to use, especially the polarised light. So this is not surprising in many ways that um, animals with this very sensitive type of compound eye are able to do this. But what is extremely surprising, and this is what I want to uh, basically end my talk with, or at least give you the, as the next part of the talk, is that there are in some parts of the world, particularly very hot tropical areas where competition for resources and um, competition from predators actually is very, very extreme, some animals have been forced um, to adopt lifestyles which traditionally their relatives in cooler parts of the world would never dreamed of adopting. So they're pushed by evolution into difficult conditions. And this is one of these animals. This is a nocturnal bee. Very, very few bees have become nocturnal. But there are a number of them now that we know of that are nocturnal, and the reason for that is, is that the competition for flowers is very severe during the day. There are many other species of bees and other types of insects, actually, that are all after the same floral resources. And there are a number of flowers that only open at night in the tropics, and they take advantage of those. In addition, the pre predators are much more problematic during the day than they are at night. There are many more of them during the day. So many species in the tropics have been forced to become completely nocturnal. Unfortunately, they used to have an apposition eye because they were, before at least, day active creatures. And then when this happened, they didn't have enough time to do anything about it, so they've dragged their apposition eye into the night with them. And it, actually, it's not trivial at all to go from this design to the superposition di design. That's only happened a couple of times within butterflies and moths, as, we, as far as we know. They live, to make it worse, this night active bee with this very insensitive eye lives in this environment. A very difficult environment. Um, they have to fly through that in the dead of night to go looking for flowers from the nest. And the nest for these insects is a small hollowed out stick buried in what for us at least is a completely indistinguishable clump of undergrowth 
but we can't tell the difference from that clump of undergrowth to any other clump of undergrowth in the rainforest. And it's a hollowed out stick sticking out of this undergrowth that they've hollowed out and they raise their young inside this stick. And well after sunset, they leave the nest and go foraging through the rainforest. We now know hundreds of meters away looking for pollen and uh, nectar to bring back to the nest through the same rainforest. And they find their way home without any problem whatsoever. And we wondered very early whether or not they were able to use their very apparently poor apposition eyes, which theoretically should give them, make them totally blind in the early dusk, long before they're actually active in the rainforest. And we first wondered, do they or do they not use vision at all? So to look at this experiment, we took advantage of something we knew from day active bees. And that is, you probably don't realize this, but if you have a hive, at home in the backyard if you're interested in keeping bees. One thing that you'll notice if you watch them is that especially the, the newly um, hatched bees, when they're out on their early foraging trips, their first foraging trips, what they do is that they leave the nest, they turn around in midair while flying, and they begin to make a backwards flight in arcs in front of their hive. What they're actually doing is learning the arrangement of visual landmarks around the nest so that they can recognize them when they return home. And by recognizing that arrangement of landmarks, they can pinpoint the entrance to their nest relative to those landmarks. They do the same thing along the entire foraging route, la learning and remembering landmarks between the flowers where they're visiting and the nest. And they can find their way backwards and forwards along that route just by recalling the landmarks in the right sequence. And we realized very early that they looked like they were doing roughly the same thing. So when we were filming them with infrared cameras in the pitch dark, because we can't possibly see them otherwise, and observing them with night vision goggles, we saw what, we, what appeared to be a similar type of flight behavior. So we tried to exploit this by... I'll see if I can activate this thing again. By doing a sim very simple experiment where we took one of these nest sticks where it lived, and the occupied nest stick is shown as the one marked with a star in all of these panels. And then we created a landmark system by placing it in the middle of four other nests. These ones are abandoned old nests that have no bees in them. So two on one side and two on the other. And our prediction was that if the bee flew out of here and learned this arrangement of nests as a sequence set of landmarks, then it would recognize that its own nest was in the middle and that, it, um, that when it returned, it needed to find the nest in the middle. So our prediction was that's exactly what it would do. Unfortunately for the bee, we did something very nasty while it was away. We actually moved its nest to the end and took an empty abandoned nest and put it in the middle. Um, so it wasn't its own nest, in other words. And when it flew back, it flew exactly as predicted, straight into that middle nest. About one second later, it flew straight back out again, extremely upset. Either it didn't feel right or it smelt weird or whatever. And then it flew again in front of the nests and then re realized it must be the one in the middle and straight back in again. One second later, straight back out, same thing. And over and over and over again, in, out, in, out, in, out, until you actually took pity on the bee, or we did. Uh, and then you put its nest back in the middle again, put the empty one back on the end. And then the bee went in and stayed there and was quite happy. So that was a strong indication that indeed it is able to learn visual landmarks around the nest and not use olfaction because if it was simply the smell of the nest it went for, then it would have gone into the newly placed nest on the end there uh, as the first choice, but it didn't do that. To back this up, what we did was we did another experiment where we put a conspicuous white card over the end of the nest with a hole in it. Um, this is a very, very obvious landmark that the bee should learn very quickly. And instead of moving the nest, which we left in the same place, we just instead left the, uh, we, we moved the card to a neighboring nest after the bee had departed for its foraging trip. So in this case, it left at 18.40 and almost 20 minutes later it came back. But by then, we'd have, we moved this card to the neighboring nest. Exactly as predicted, it flew into the nest with the card, not its own nest. Again, in, out, in, out, in, out, until you finally take pity on the bee, put the card back on the central nest and in it goes and stays there. So that, that was an indication that, for us at least, that the... Um, uh, animal, the bee was actually using visual landmarks to do this, to do this job. Actually, how am I going for time? I just forgot what time I started. Yeah, have I? I think you have, uh, have at least 15 minutes more. Okay, good. Oh, that's fine. That's all I need. Okay, one of the things we, we noticed was that, yes, that it's extraordinarily dark at this time of the evening when they're doing this um, behavior. We're unable to actually see them ourselves with the naked eye. In fact, we can see basically bugger all with our naked eyes. If you walk around without uh, night vision goggles, you'll fall over very quickly and hurt yourself badly. Um, 
when we were back in the lab and we stimulated the visual system with exactly the same light intensities, it's actually possible by sticking electrodes into the visual photoreceptors of the eye to actually record the responses to light at those light levels. And at, that light, at those light levels, when they're active, they're actually responding with, um, to single photons of light. So these little, little responses that you see, these are voltage responses recorded with an electrode from the photoreceptors, these are the responses to single photons. Now, there's nothing remarkable about this. Our photoreceptors do the same thing. We're able to see single photons as well. You just probably don't realise, but you can, actually. Um, but it, nonetheless, when these bees were active and landing on their nest and travelling through the rainforest, each of their photoreceptors was, ex was absorbing about five photons every second only. That's absurdly little light and really terrifyingly small amounts of light. So, in other words, uh, we were left with a bit of a quandary because if you do some simple calculations, you quickly realise that even the brightest contrast around, which is the dark hole in the end of its nest stick, um, can't be seen unless you have about 100 times as much light as that per second. So they need a lot more light, at least 100 times more light than that to be able to see, according to calculations at least. But nonetheless, these bees have the ability to land on their nest in the dark. This is a very, very low light level. Everything here is filmed in infrared, which neither we nor they can see. As you can see, they landed without any problem. And just to convince you of that, um, here they are again, I hope. Yes, here it is again, landing uh, slowed down by a factor of 10. And you can see there's no indication that it goes sm smashes its head into the end of the nest. It lands very gingerly and goes back into its nest without the slightest problem. Um, and we now know that it does that with a precision and accuracy of landing exactly the same as that that you would find in a day active bee. No difference at all. So they're able to see extra extraordinarily well. So one could therefore then ask, how on earth can you account for this major anomaly? That is, what's going on in the eyes relative to what's happening at the level of the behaviour, because the two just don't compute, they don't add up. It must be something in the middle, maybe in the brain, that is actually filling that gap that we have. And our hypothesis has been for a number of years, and we've just this year managed to prove that this is in fact true. I, can't, I don't have time to tell you about this at all. But our hypothesis has been that these nocturnal bees and other nocturnal insects, actually, are able to improve visual reliability by neurally summing photons in time and space. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that. Basically, you can um, understand this by thinking about a camera. And those of us who are, who are as old as I am, at least, um, I'm one of the oldest here, I suspect, but those of us who have, are old enough to have used a completely manual camera will remember, hopefully, that in dim light, you can increase the exposure time on the camera using that knob there um, and actually allow the shutter to remain open longer in order to get more light at the image plane and increase the brightness of the image. Okay? The biggest problem with doing that, as you probably also remember, is that anything that moves quickly in the world can't be distinguished anymore on the film. So a fast-moving car is only seen in, at night, for instance, is only seen as a kind of a blurry streak of light and nothing else. So that fast-moving object is not resolved. Um, this means that if you do this in the eye and in the, in the visual system, this, the, the exposure time actually does exist. Our photoreceptors have an inbuilt exposure time. And this is referred to as the integration time, and, and it's symbolised by the symbol delta T. I want you just to take note of that, because in a couple of slides I'm going to show this again. Okay, integration time delta T. So you sacrifice the resolution of things occurring in time by increasing your exposure time. In addition, at the same time even, and in fact in parallel, you should really do this, you can also sum light in space. Now this is like making a, a super pixel by grouping together the signals of a large number of, of, of individual original pixels. So in the case of a compound eye, this might be like taking the signals coming out of a group of 10 of these omatidia, a small group of neighbouring omatidia, pooling all the signals together using some kind of, of neuron at a higher level, some kind of um, nervous cell that actually sums all these signals together and create a giant super omatidium out of 10 individual omatidia. Now the benefit of doing that is that that giant super omatidium is now viewing a much larger region of space. And of course a larger region of space emits more light. 
so you capture more light from that larger pixel. So you get a brighter image, but of course, as you can imagine, by creating larger, fewer pixels, you also sacrifice spatial resolution. In other words, your, your image becomes a lot coarser. Okay? But, but the image becomes, admittedly, a lot brighter, and maybe that's okay. And that pixel size, um, which I'm about to explain a bit more of, is symbolized by this symbol here, delta rho p. So I just want you to remember that as well. But despite this, despite this um, loss of resolution, both in time and space, it might actually be better to see a brighter world that's coarser and slower than to see nothing at all. And so this was our hypothesis. That this is maybe what nocturnal insects are actually doing. And as I mentioned before, our hypothesis here is built on the idea that there are neurons, uh, I'll just pop over here to explain this, there are neurons which are actually summing signals from groups of omatidia. So in a conventional day-active apposition compound eye, the nervous cells which are coming down from the photoreceptors, the so-called photoreceptor axons, are synapsing onto second-order cells which are carrying information further to the brain. There's no connections between these. They're completely parallel channels collecting light from those lenses, ultimately. In the model that we proposed instead, in the nocturnal bees and in other nocturnal insects, is that each one of those has side branches which connect to others, so that you actually collect light as it's travelling through and sum it together and create a large group in two dimensions, obviously, of omatidia which are being pooled to create spatial summation. And we went looking for these cells in this part of the brain here. This is a, a picture through the, the, the brain of a bee. As you can see, it's a very, very sophisticated structure. This is the central brain. These parts here, the lobula, the medulla, the lamina, and actually out here, the retina, this is, these parts here are entirely devoted to processing visual information and do things very similarly to the various parts of our own visual cortex. So evolution is incredible here. It's con convergently evolved to do very similar things in insects as, they, as occurs in our own brain. And the part of the brain that I'm going to tell you about here is this region here, the lamina. This is the region where the photoreceptor axons are reaching these second order cells I mentioned. And indeed, when we started looking at the structure of these cells, they had enormous side branches. You don't find that in a diurnal bee, a day-active bee. They're not there. So those big branching second-order cells do exist, actually, in nocturnal bees. And that strengthened our hypothesis. So then, and now I just want to finish with this, then we, I developed, and this is where the technological um, uh, application came in. Before we had the possibility of proving this, which took us a very, very long time with a lot of electro electrophysiological um, uh, re um, experiments at different regions in the visual system with electrodes, which we've just completed this year, uh, and shown what I'm about to tell you is actually true. But until then, we could only really model this and find out if it could work theoretically. So what we did is we asked what the finest spatial detail that could be seen by a bee with or without the presence of this spatial and temporal summation. Could you actually, despite the fact that the world is coarser and slower, could you nonetheless see more information with summation than without? And to answer this question, what we did is we said, what is the finest spatial detail that could be seen with and without summation? And the finest spatial detail is defined on the basis of the density of a striped pattern. And this is called the stripe pattern's spatial frequency. The denser the stripes, in other words, the finer the stripes, the more tightly and densely packed they are, the finer or the higher the spatial frequency. So we asked, what is the highest spatial frequency that a bee could see in the presence of summation? And is that highest spatial frequency greater than it would be if summation was absent? And indeed, it turned out that if you plot that highest spatial Oops, the highest visible spatial frequency here on the y-axis as a function of light level going from room light levels or sort of early dusk levels down to starlight levels. Here is the curve that you got for the nocturnal bee during or with summation. The dotted line shows the performance without. And what you see during the window of activity, this is the light intensity window that the bee is actually active in, this yellow, this sort of starlight region here you see that there is a considerable improvement in the finest detail that can be seen in the presence of summation. In other words, they become blind at a much brighter light level without summation than with it. And we've now proved, actually, that this is in fact happening in the visual system, as I said. But what it ended up with is that it turns out 
that at any one light level, going from, say, dusk down to starlight, at any given light level, there is a single combination of exposure times and pixel sizes in the visual system that maximizes the amount of spatial information you can get out of the visual scene. And that turns out to change. And the, as light levels fall, these values get larger. So the size of the integration time increases, or the length of the integration time increases, the size of the pixel increases as light level drops. And the, for, these, for this combination, you get a, maximi a maximization of this uh, spatial detail that you can see in the scene. And that model was very clear that, that spatial and temporal summation worked, should work very well. Toyota got wind of this um, fact, and they were very interested and are currently developing this now. Uh, they're very interested in developing camera systems for their cars that don't use infrared light to illuminate ahead in order for the camera to work. Instead, they, want to be, they wanted to develop a camera that was actually using the available light in the environment to, to provide a better image for a driver of the car to see animals and pedestrians on the road, um, and where one didn't have to provide any kind of artificial illumination from the, level, from the point of view of the car, at least. So they were very interested in this technology, and so uh, we collaborated with them, and two mathematicians uh, from the department next door to us came and worked on the project with me and developed algorithms based on that theoretical model that I developed to see whether or not it was possible to actually improve the video quality of videos that were filmed in extremely dim light and actually work out whether you could in fact improve them by doing the, making this strategy as we had detected in insects. So what we did as part of this project, it's the most fun I've ever had with grant money, I think. Um, and I've done a lot of travelling, actually, and had a lot of fun, but this was really fun. So we went to a, a fancy German train set shop just north of Lund um, in Helsingborg. Um, one of, I think it's Marcolin, is this German train set company, and they had a whole shop. And we just went in there and bought this fantastic train set and created this entire environment with artificial lights and a train track. And we had a train moving through this environment with a, with a machine vision camera mounted on the top of the train, and we filmed a sequence in a sort of a semi-natural environment with controlled but very dim light. We filmed a film from the train roof uh, as the train travelled through this train set. And then we applied the model, uh, the new algorithm which we developed to, to this, to try and work out whether or not it improved the amount of information available. So here is what we got initially. That's the... I should get this going, I think. That's the before image. So you don't see an awful lot at all. You see the the lights in the windows of the, of the buildings. And people who make these train sets are completely crazy. They love this, so they make them really realistic. So you can buy these little tiny lamps to put inside the buildings. But you don't see an awful lot at all. But as soon as you take that very same film and then um, put it through the algorithm developed that we um, had developed as a result of this collaboration, this is instead what you get. And so you can see our pet spider Charlotte is moving through there. But you can see there's a couple of things I want to point out with this video. The first, obviously, things are a little bit sort of coarser spatially and they look a bit more sluggish temporally. Um, but nonetheless, you can see stuff that you couldn't see in the previous film, a lot more stuff actually. And you can obviously see Charlotte, which you couldn't see before either. The other thing, because we've done that summation in, a, in, a, in the correct way, you can also retain colour information. And so what this told us was not only did our algorithms work based on the visual systems of insects, but that this gave us a clue that, that we could apply backwards into the animal and say, well, actually, if they did do this, then they could probably see in colour. They could probably see as well as this, in fact, as they flew through a rainforest at night, which would be a lot better to see than what you saw in the previous film. So the take-home message from all of this is, um, from our point of view, is that this, this spin-off that's now we're in Toyota's hands, we don't know, it's, it's secret, so we don't really know what's going on, to be honest. But for me, at least personally, what this proved was that, um, uh, apart from the fact that blue skies research can lead to applications, it also gave us clues backwards to, to sort of validate our original hypotheses about how nocturnal insects are able to cope with this ph phenomenally challenging environment where they live. Uh, and as I said, we've since been able to now look more carefully at different regions of the visual system and now we've measured from cells at high levels in the visual system exactly what we're showing in these films. 
uh, and we've now proved it, which is nice. So with that, I'll just say thank you very much. These are nocturnal insects, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. So um, the videos you showed in the end, or the two different videos, were they based on exactly the same data and then yes, just post-processing? Yes. The second one is the first one. Just um, processed with the algorithm. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> Um, I do bee experiments, so I know how difficult it is to follow a bee in the day. How do you follow a bee in the dark? You can't. Okay. So we have no idea where they're, where they're going. It's, once they leave the area around the nest, they've just disappeared. Okay. So we can't see them anymore. It's impossible. It's too dark. But we, we're always sitting there watching them with night vision goggles, keeping them trained on the nests. And we stay, we stay there trained on the nests until they come back. Of course, okay. if we don't, we miss them. Yeah. I was hoping. <laughs> How are you sure it's the same bee? How, how do you know it's the same bee? Mm. That's a very good question. Well, that assume, that's, a, that's based on the assumption that there's only one bee in the nest that we're experimenting on. And that's normally the case, actually. But sometimes the, there can be two. And then it's a real problem, actually. Then you can't really say. Yeah, and that, that, in some experiments that we've done, that's messed things up a lot, actually. <laughs> Quite interesting that Toyota showed interest in this. How did they come about your research? I did a pilot study that, um, in collaboration with somebody at um, Kungliga Techniska Hergskule, and we had a student who did a kind of a, a pilot project to see if it was even um, feasible. And the result of that project, that was a, a master's level project, uh, was that it was very feasible. And they made a little tiny article out of it for the local internal newspaper, I guess they found, somehow nabbed onto it. I think they've got feelers out everywhere. Mm -hmm. Keep, I, I really don't know, to be honest. And it was quite a shock to get rung up by them, yeah. out of the blue. Of course, I, I guess that's, that's one of the problems in biomimetics. Uh, how, to, how do companies actually get hold of the right researchers and the right piece of uh, knowledge, which would be interesting for their business? I mean. Now it's clear that Toyota, they are interested in night vision, so, so you can park your car mm. or maybe even steer it automatically yeah. by night. Yeah, who knows? But yeah, in many other cases, what to do? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm just as mystified as you. And I know, I'm, believe it or not, I was very surprised that they, when they called, because mm. I, um, I thought it was interesting to see if one could use it for improving video, but it was more of an academic interest rather than a applied one mm. so I was a bit stunned when I got when when they rang but it implies that they've obviously got their eyes open all the time yep. and feelers out everywhere but maybe not every company does that I've got no idea but I just maybe I just I mean, I'm quite naive about the way companies work so maybe they not all companies do that obviously right any more questions doesn't seem to be the case then uh I have a little present for you and then we'll give you oh, a hand. Thank you. <laughs>